So, hello, my name is Samantha or Sam Harlow. I'm the online learning kinesiology public health education librarian for UNCG University Libraries. The Libraries and the University Teaching and Learning Center, or the UTLC, collaborated on making a series of webinars for the UNCG community on online learning innovation. This is the fifth webinar for this series, so if it's your first time joining us, welcome. Um, if it's not, then welcome again. In this series, different UNCG instructional technology consultants, ITS staff, and faculty will cover topics on online learning pedagogies, UNCG instructional technology tools such as Canvas, Google, Box, WebEx, et cetera, and more. These are typically 30-minute webinars, but today's session is a special topic that we will cover in an hour. We understand if you need to leave, um, this will be recorded if you can't stay the whole time. So um, all of these will be recorded and they'll be placed on this library guide, um, which I am putting in the chat. Um, we will also give the recording file to the um, staff member or faculty member presenting the materials and then they can put it where they see fit. So I'm gonna cover some logistical things about how this webinar is going to run. Please mute your audio during the presentation by clicking the audio icon next to your name to turn it red, but feel free to turn the audio back on by clicking the audio icon again at the end of the webinar to participate in a conversation with the presenters. If you do not have a microphone, you are also welcome to participate in the chat. Right now it's set that you are um, chatting me privately, but you can change it to everyone if you want everyone to see your question, but I will field the questions and let people know how it's going. Um, you know, stop the presenter if I feel like it needs to happen during the middle of the um, session. So um, I will track those questions either, like I said, privately and put them in there. So if there's any technical issues during the webinar, feel free to email me. I'll have my email up um, there, or you can call me at my office and um, let me know what's going on, and I'll try to talk you through some issues. So that information is in the chat as well. So at this point, um, before I introduce the presenter or presenters, does anyone have any questions? Okay, so I'll assume that, that means everyone's good to go. So today's session is on academic integrity, Canvas, and ways to avoid violations. This webinar is being presented by Amanda Shipman and Matt Libera, both from UNCG Information Technology Services, or ITS. This session will be one hour based on that it's a topic of interest and will be presented in two parts. And we're going to start with Amanda and Canvas. So again, like I said before, we understand if you need to leave early and this is being recorded and will be um, put on these guides later for you to watch. So now I'm going to stop sharing this nice little flyer and I'm going to hand the presenting abilities to Matt. Are you ready, Matt? Yep, I'm good to go. So you want me to hand it to your laptop? Uh, no, just go ahead and hand it to me. Um, I'll run the slideshow while Amanda talks and then I'll okay. hand it to my portion Here as well. it comes. All right. Thanks, Sam. I'm Hello. just going to give her a minute to let that load. As Matt mentioned, he's running the slides while I start talking, so apologize if it's not quite on cue, <laughs> but we'll go with it. Um, so as Sam mentioned, um, my name is Amanda Shipman. I'm an ITS, and Matt is here with me, Matt Libera, who's also an ITS. We both do Canvas administration. So I'm going to start off talking about specifically Turnitin in Canvas. And Matt's going to talk a little bit about designing and setting up quizzes in Canvas to deter cheating. Um, so just a little bit, you know, every teacher dreads it, the uh, academic integrity violation. Um, mostly the confrontation with the student, the time uh, that it takes to gather evidence, just all the hassle of it all. So hopefully Matt and I can help you with this and provide some information and tips which will allow you to avoid those violations and if not avoid, deal with them um, efficiently. And I'll just say real quickly, again, I'm going to briefly talk about Turnitin and then Matt's going to talk in detail about Canvas quizzes and I'll say we've kind of deemed him the expert on, on these academic integrity violations. He's been lucky enough to go to numerous 
uh, academic integrity, uh, what are they called, cases, or uh, they're not trials, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, so he's been the, the, the blessed one here to, to be able to do that. All right, if you want to navigate to the first Turnitin slide, Matt. Next one. All right, so if you weren't aware, we do have Turnitin available for everyone to use in all courses. It's primarily used for its originality checking feature, but there are other tools available in Turnitin. For example, you can use Feedback Studio, um, which is a grading tool that's very similar to SpeedGrader. There are some advantages to using uh, Feedback Studio. We won't go into a lot of detail, but Feedback Studio does include a comment bank where you can store comments to, to place into the text of a student's paper. So it may save a little time. Um, but as of now, I'm finding that most people continue to use SpeedGrader to grade papers even when, even when they're using Turnitin. Um, if you have any questions about Feedback Studio and want one of us to work with you, um, I'm happy to do so. So if you'll just open up a Six Tech ticket and it'll get over to us. Um, but use of Turnitin, if you've ever used Turnitin at any other university, you may have gone directly to the Turnitin portal and, and logged in there and used it. But here at UNCG, it could be done entirely through Canvas on a per assignment basis. Um, basically, instructors set up Turnitin enabled assignments in Canvas, and then students submit work to those assignments, and it therefore generates a similarity report. Those similarity reports are available to the instructor via the Turnitin assignment inbox. When you set up a Turnitin assignment, uh, you'll see the Turnitin inbox within the Canvas assignment. You can also, um, and you'll actually see an image of the Turnitin inbox right here. So you'll actually see this in your Canvas assignment if you're using Turnitin. Uh, you'll also see the similarity score in a Canvas speed grader, in the Canvas speed grader. So if you're at the top right of speed grader, for those of you who've used it, you'll be able to see the similarity score and click on it to open up the similarity report. So if you're looking at uh, the inbox Right here on the screen, if you click on the similarity score, that's going to open up the report for you. And then also make available to you Feedback Studio and the other Turnitin tools available. As far as students viewing the similarity report, it's entirely up to the instructor as to whether or not you want them to see this report. And we'll talk more about what the report is and, and how, how you can choose for them to do that. Next slide. All right, so some of you might ask, what exactly is my student's work being checked against when they submit it to turn it in? So there are basically three types of databases which are used for comparison. And actually in the Turnitin settings, when you set up an assignment, you can choose not to use any of these three databases. Um, but for the most part, the default is set, so it's going to check each of these type of databases when students submit work. I'm not entirely sure of the scenario right away where you wouldn't want that to happen. But the default is that all of these databases are checked. Um, the first type of database is the, the web, which they call the current and archived web. It's I would consider this comparable to taking the text of a student's paper, throwing it into a Google search and then seeing what is publicly available out there on the web, which the student's work may match against. Um, Wikipedia would be a good example of this. And according to Turnitin, there's about 62 billion web pages from the current and archive web that's available out there, which they're searching against. Um, the second type of database is the, the student repository, which consists of all student work that's submitted through Turnitin at all institutions. Um, and it, this is not just UNCG, so it's searching uh, for matches, although, you know, a lot of times if students are reusing work, a lot of the matches are going to be here at UNCG, maybe in another course that you're teaching if students are reusing work and passing along to other students in the same course. But this, this database is going to consist over, a, over 734 million papers. 
And according to Turnitin, they say that it grows by nearly 200,000 papers a day. So there's a lot of data out there that it's that it's looking over. Um, and according to Turnitin, interesting, interestingly enough, they say that uh, over 50% of plagiarism comes from other students' work, which is a little surprising to me. I would have assumed the web, um, but this is according to Turnitin, and I'd have to do a little more research to see uh, what other folks are saying. The last type of database that is searched are what they label content partnerships, um, but this consists of periodicals, journals, and other digital publications. So this would be akin to searching the text of all the libraries, journals, and all of their in all of their databases. Uh, there are over 160 million articles in these databases for Turnitin. So that's just a general overview of what your student's work is being compared to when they submit through Turnitin. Okay, Matt, you can go to the next slide. So the similarity report, this is, is what you're after when usually when you have students submit to Turnitin. Um, and once Turnitin has had enough time to process the paper, this is what you get. Uh, generally, they're uh, returned in about 15 minutes after submission, but according to Turnitin, may take as much as 24 hours. Um, the report provides a match overview, which is a breakdown of all the matches that have been uh, found ordered by the highest similarity score to the lowest. And these might be a combination of sources, might be websites and other students' papers um, and, and a mixture of things. It's important to note that the similarity score is not an assessment of, where, of whether or not the paper includes plagiarized material. Um, it's just text match, so it requires human intervention. You have to look at the paper and and review whether students have properly cited sources, whether they're using a lot of, you know, direct quotes. It does it doesn't do all the work for you. I get that question a lot. Um, and there are some settings you can tweak and turn it in to try to make it a little smarter. But for the most part, it's still going to require you or some other human to review that report and actually see what's going on. Next slide. Um, so like I said, similarity index is not a plagiarism index. Human intervention is required. Um, the index is not, just keep in mind, no score is inherently good or bad. Zero percent for a similarity score doesn't necessarily mean that everything is okay with the student's paper, and 75 percent doesn't necessarily mean that the student should flunk. You have to look and decide what's going on here. Um, I did have one additional note that kind of corresponds with the previous slide about pay-per-view requests. If one of those matches um, that comes up in the match overview is actually, um, if the source is another student's paper, whether it's another student here at UNCG or at another institution, you can actually submit a um, pay-per-view request. And what this does is Turnitin will generate an email and send it to you um, as well as to the, well, it'll send it to you and then allow you to then forward to the instructor. It'll tell you who the instructor is of the source, which was a match. Because what will happen is initially you won't be able to see the full text of the other student's work, who, whomever submitted the original uh, paper. So you'll forward that email request over to the instructor, again, whether it's at UNCG or some other institution, and then it's up to that instructor to then be able to respond and send you the full text. And they get an email as well with the full text of the paper in it, and they just simply forward it to you. Seems a little confusing. I'm not doing a real good job with describing the process, but it's really self-explanatory once you get in there. So if you want to see the full text, that's something you'll have to do. It's not going to be immediately available to you in turn it in. So one thing that I talk with folks about is using Turnitin as a teaching tool versus what I call a, a gotcha tool. And, and a lot of people use it that way. 
um, and I call it a gotcha tool because they just are immediately, they want to use the tool just to immediately find students that plagiarize and, and punish them. Um, but I try to think of it and, and help them think of it as a way to use it as a teaching tool to help students understand what exactly they're doing wrong. Um, and one of the things I looked into in, in looking and doing some research um, to help understand why students plagiarize, um, and maybe that will then encourage you and others to use this as a teaching tool instead of just a gotcha tool. So interesting enough, these are some of the reasons I found um, the first being, and I hear this all the time, many students do not know that they are plagiarizing. And in the age today, with all the, the digital information available to us, uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, they think simply by rewording what they've read on Wikipedia or some other source, that they're not plagiarizing when they actually are. Um, some students know what plagiarism is, but they don't consider it wrong. Um, not sure I can reason that one, but <laughs> um, but that is something that's come up. Uh, students are natural economizers. Uh, they're just um, and they're poor, have poor time management and planning skills. They wait to the last minute. They're just trying to get something done fast and easily. Um, so these are some reasons. And then some students fear that their writing ability is inadequate. So in, in an effort to try to improve their own writing they're copying what they see um, off someone else's. So those are some reasons. I think a lot. some of those make a lot of sense and would give me at least enough reason to want to use Turnitin as a teaching tool um, instead of just a gotcha tool. And another reason you might want to do this, and I'm going to uh, tell you what to do right now, is um, this enables, so a lot of what a lot of instructors want to do or allow their students to do is to submit their work to turn it in before they actually turn it in for a grade. So this is a way that we can do that. So if you go to the next slide, Matt, um, we'll talk about setting up a turn it in assignment um, as a draft assignment. So you'll actually set up two separate assignments here. You'll set up a draft assignment which is going to provide the student multiple opportunities to submit their work to Turnitin to check for plagiarism. And then you'll have a separate assignment with some different settings that you'll set up for the final graded submission. So if you want to give students an opportunity to check their work to, and to use this as a teaching tool, you're going to want to set up these two separate assignments. And maybe you do this for your first writing assignment. Maybe you do this for all of them. That's up to you. Um, but what you'll do is, um, when you're interning in, setting, an, setting up an assignment in Canvas, um, here are the settings that you'll want to pay attention to. Um, and these are settings that are appear in Turnitin after you've saved the Canvas assignment that you've just set up. The first is do not store submitted papers. This is just going to ensure that that draft version or versions that students are submitting to Turnitin, they aren't stored in the student paper repository, so when they submit again, it's not a match against itself. So that's the first thing you want to make sure you do when you're setting up a draft assignment. If you want to go to the next slide, Matt. Uh, the next is when you're looking at the similarity report settings, you want to allow turn it in to generate the reports immediately. The other option is that it actually waits to generate the report on the due date. We don't want to do that. We want to re generate the report immediately. And then in the same option, you allow students to resubmit until the due date. So they can continue to submit to turn it in and tweak their paper, rewrite, re, you know, do whatever they need to do and keep checking it um, multiple times. After three submissions, though, it does slow down and take longer to generate the similarity report in between those submissions. And lastly is you want to make sure in the settings that you allow students to view the similarity reports. Again, I mentioned earlier, it's entirely up to you whether or not instructors sometimes that are using this more of a gotcha tool, they may not allow students to view the similarity reports, but in the way that I'm talking about using this as a way for them to check their work, you need to make sure that setting is checked off. And that's basically um, it as far as setting up a draft and giving them an opportunity to check their work. Um, the last slide here 
is just a list of resources um, for Turnitin. The first being, if you go to Turnitin's website and their support resources, it's kind of all over the place. Um, they give you a lot of details of accessing Turnitin outside of Canvas. So instead of going to Turnitin for this information, uh, the folks at Canvas or Instructure have done a great job with documenting this process. So um, creating a Turnitin assignment, the instructions are here. There are also instructions for how students submit a Turnitin assignment, because I'll be honest, it can get a little tricky for students, and it's not difficult, it's just different um, than what they see when they're submitting a, a standard Canvas assignment. So I think it is helpful for students to have this information. And then um, some information, additional information on inter interpreting a similarity report is here as well. And these slides, I'll make sure they're shared so that you'll have access to these URLs. And lastly, I just wanted to say that um, myself, I, in conjunction with Anita Warford, the ITC, or Instructional Technology Consultant in the College of Arts and Sciences, we're actually doing a workshop in February on plagiarism and Turnitin. So we'll go into much more detail um, with setting up these assignments um, in that workshop. So if you want to join join us in that workshop, feel free to sign up there. And again, we'll share the URLs with you guys so you'll have them and not have to copy them down right now. And that's it for me right now. I'll hold questions and there'll be an opportunity at the end to ask questions, but I'm going to pass it over to Matt Libera, who's going to talk uh, about something I actually find a little more interesting than turn it in, but um, he's going to talk about quizzes in Canvas and um, setting up uh, quizzes to help deter cheating. Sorry, Amanda, before you start that, we did get a question of um, when you were talking about the students being added into the databases, you know, and when they submit their papers to turn it in. They um, then ask, do you have to let students know that their papers are being added to that database as part of their participation in the course? I don't think so. I believe we have something in our, because uh, we had to do this when we first adopted Turnitin, there's something in the, oh, what is it, when you accept the, when you activate your computing accounts, you're accepting, um, I'm trying to think what it's called. Put me on the spot. Um, what is it? The it's not terms. It's whatever you're agreeing to when you activate your accounts um, here at USEG. Um, when you're activating your email, Canvas on those. There's a little message in there about um, that your work may be submitted to turn it in. So legally, we're covered. I'm sure it's, a, and there's some other stuff in Turnitin's website that I was reading about how uh, fair right and copyright, fair use and copyright, they're covered by fair use. So um, I don't think you have to uh, necessarily let them know because they're covered in that account activation piece, but I think it's probably a good idea. And then we had another question. Um, do similarity matches only flag exact text matches? matches and turn it in, such as what happens if students just change the order of the words? It really depends on the settings that you've put in there. So um, you can exclude small matches, so I think that would affect whether or not, but um, if you don't exclude small matches, yeah, it's going to be small exact matches. So I think depending on how much they've reworded it, that's going to be up for it may or may not come up. I wouldn't be able to speak to that, um, how well it can detect that. Okay, and the last thing is that when you were talking about plagiarism, I did just want to say, because I think it's a little different than like quiz strategies that Matt's going to talk about, but um, the library does have tutorials on plagiarism, um, and we can, they're online, so even if it's an online class, you can just like link it in your course, because like Amanda was saying, in our experience, a lot of times students don't think they're plagiarizing, <laughs> they just think it's okay to copy and paste some things, so um, keep that in mind as well. And I'm, I'll put some links in here to the workshops that Amanda referenced, as well as some of the tutorials we're talking about. So, okay, Matt, you're good to go. Does anyone else have any questions for Amanda before Matt goes? Okay, I'm muting myself again. All right. Um, 
So, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Matt, um, and I've been aptly introduced by uh, both Sam and Amanda by now. But uh, yes, I do have the dubious honor of being involved um, as a, I don't want to say a witness, but it's not the right, quite the right word, but I've been involved in the process for uh, um, the academic integrity hearings a lot lately on Kansas quizzes. So I kind of thought it would be good for me to talk a little bit about um, how to maybe not let things get to that point so much. Um, so the whole fo focus of my presentation here is going to be on uh, utilizing uh, Canvas to uh, help deter cheating on the quizzes. Uh, as more and more courses are being moved online or utilizing our online LMS, of course, some of the nice features here are the ability to give quizzes that are immediately graded and you get instant feedback for your students and everything. It's easier for us, it's easier for them. Um, so, but with that comes a little bit of extra challenge in that we no longer have complete control over the quiz environment. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and just give you a quick overview. I'm a, I'm a slideshow, um, I like slideshows and so I kind of bullet out all my thoughts here. So uh, you'll have to excuse me from reading a lot of these slides to you, but um, I do wanna go through and just kind of give you the overview. So uh, I will start, talk, talk, start talking about common problems we experience um, how to define expectations and policies. Um, we'll talk about question design and quiz settings, uh, some of the proctoring options we have available here. And then of course, we'll talk a little bit about dealing with it when it happens. So that's my plan. Um, so I'm gonna start basically by just saying, you know, there's a will, when there's a will, there's a way. Um, and so no matter what you do, the students are gonna try and get around you. Um, it comes back a lot to what Amanda was saying about student psychology, you know, students just like to, you know, they don't, they don't want to feel inadequate or they, you know, whatever the reason is, it's going to happen. So we're just going to do our best to uh, to prevent it and to deal with it uh, appropriately when it does happen. Uh, so a little bit about how we're finding students cheat these days. Uh, they're getting more creative uh, with their quiz cheating. So ideally, our environment for students taking a quiz would mean that they are uh, alone, obviously, not seeking help from other people in the same room or on the phone or whatever it is. Uh, they'd be applying their own knowledge, so not using other sources, uh, and of course they'd be fully focused on the quiz, uh, not getting distracted by other things or doing other things while they are taking the quiz. Uh, in the cases of academic integrity violations that, that we have seen recently, uh, we've seen a lot of violations of this. We've seen collaborative quiz taking, students sitting in the same room taking the quiz together, or they have somebody who has already taken the quiz sitting with them. Uh, they're obtaining answers from past courses, uh, people who have taken the quiz before them have basically taken down their answers and handed them off. Uh, they're obtaining answers from other classmates who have already taken the quiz, so the same way, just with other classmates uh, in, the, in the same class. They're looking up answers on the internet, um, and of course, they're exhibiting distracted quiz-taking behavior, doing more than one thing uh, while they're taking the quiz. Uh, a lot of the times that is uh, related to looking up answers on the internet as well. Um, so I kind of thought about this and I said, well, what, what should our goals be? And I think what it really boiled down to is that we need to try and make it not worthwhile for students to engage in this kind of behavior, uh, make it too time consuming or difficult to do, uh, the reward is not worth the risk, um, or make it so the student doesn't really feel the need to cheat. I guess that would be our, our perfect world scenario. Um, and then of course, we also want to be able to set ourselves up well to be able to identify and deal with these cases of cheating. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what uh, Canvas does and doesn't provide for instructors and for administrators, uh, the kind of data that we have that can that can tell us a little more about what a student has been doing during a quiz. Um, and then one thing I'll come back to a little bit later is this definition of uh, acceptable quiz taking behavior. Um, so the, uh, yeah, and there's a little footnote here, making it so that the student doesn't feel the need to cheat is actually very difficult. Um, and of course, I'll come back around to that acceptable quiz taking behavior uh, in a little bit. All right, so we're gonna start with Canvas. Uh, a large part of the equation here is how we actually deal with our quizzes and quiz content. Um, so what I'm gonna cover here are, first we're gonna talk about quiz settings. So I'm gonna talk about things like shuffling answers, setting time limits, uh, one question at a time setting, backtracking, uh, show and hide, responses and results. And then I'll dive a little bit into question and quiz design, uh, question banks, question types, reusing things across semesters and sections, um, setting quiz expectations and context around quizzes. So um, I'm going to cover all of these and kind of my goal is not to say, hey, you should be using all of these features and all of these strategies. Uh, I want to go into each one, basically uh, outline what it does and how effective it is at deterring cheating. Um, and so 
Uh, again, this isn't one of those, like, you should do all of these things in order to stop cheating in your class. Uh, it's, it's not going to happen. Um, but I will talk about, in my opinion and experience, what I find to be the, the most and least, <clears throat> excuse me, least effective ways of, of dealing with cheating. All right, so we'll start off with some quiz settings. When you're creating a quiz in Canvas, you have several options available to you right out of the box. Canvas builds in these features. They're very handy. Um, the first one is uh, shuffling answers. So what is this feature? Okay, when you are giving multiple choice questions in your quiz, Canvas will scramble the answer order, basically. So, you know, if you write a question, you say answer A is this, answer B is this, answer C is this, answer D is this. When you select shuffle answers, basically they're, they're going to present those answer choices in uh, a shuffled order. So not everybody's going to see um, A, B, C, and D uh, be the same exact answer. Uh, this is very rudimentary, um, and a long time ago, this was probably pretty useful because uh, when we were doing less online quizzing, I um, you know, you always hear about things in school where people would write down answer keys while they're taking their quiz, and they just write one A, two C, three B on a little sheet of paper or whatever it was, um, and then they'll share it with somebody else who will refer to that while they're taking the quiz. Um, and so this is helpful for preventing that kind of thing, but it, it, this day and age, it's fairly rudimentary. Um, so how you utilize this, there is a shuffle answers checkbox. Uh, which is a very simple on-off switch when you're creating the quiz. Uh, you check it and it's on, you don't check it and it's off. Um, so it's definitely not a silver bullet. And it's likely not all that effective these days, but uh, the cost of one single click, there's really no downside. So I would say if you're using multiple choice questions, go ahead and uh, check that box. You might as well. There's really no reason not to. Uh, next feature is kind of on a similar vein. Um, it says imposing a time limit. So Canvas does allow you to put a time limit on an exam, and it will force submission of the exam after that time limit has expired. Um, and so, of course, the obvious thing, if you give everybody unlimited time to take, take a quiz, it can make that quiz seem a little more casual, um, and students can take as much time to take the quiz and do whatever else uh, they want to do during that time, including, you know, going to their friend Google, right? Um, so putting a time limit on the exam is another rudimentary way to, uh, to help uh, deter and um, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, we'll just go with deter. Well, it'll help deter cheating a little bit at least. Uh, and again, it's just as easy as setting up the shuffle answers. So you click the time limit toggle box, put in the number of minutes you want to give each student on a quiz, and you're good to go. Um, in my opinion, in my experience, if, if you're doing a lot of quizzes in your course, there's really no reason not, not to do this. Um, I mean, you could argue a little bit that it puts pressure on students. Um, you will have to anticipate things like test modifications for students with uh, documented disabilities. Um, but, you know, again, I think that leaving the door wide open on quizzes is a, a little bit ill-advised. Uh, excuse me, ill-advised. Okay. Uh, the next one is something that instructors tend to go toward their preference on, um, but question presentation. So Canvas will allow you to present questions um, all at once as if you gave them a uh, paper packet and they could flip back and forth through the questions at their leisure. Um, or what it can do is something unique to online quizzing, which is to give them one question at a time. So they have to focus on and answer a single question before they move on to the next question. Um, this can be done with or without disabling backtracking. So by default, if you just put on one question at a time, um, it's just going to control the display of each question. So you'll see question one, have to click a button to get to question two, click a button, get to question three. Uh, but if you don't disallow backtracking, students can go back to previous questions if, if they want to. They just have to click a button to do it instead of scrolling up the page. Um, so you have the option to enable both one at a time and backtracking separately. So um, you know, why might you want to use this? Well, when you have the entire quiz at once, if somebody's got an answer key from a previous course or from a friend, um, if they see the whole quiz at the same time, they can maybe look down their answer key and say, well, yeah, okay, this is the right answer key for this quiz because the questions all match. Um, you know, maybe that's that's a reason to use the one at a time or backtracking. Um, and of course, again, as with the other features, this is fairly rudimentary. Um, you can go in and click a couple boxes. There's a box for show one question at a time. And after you select that, you can also select lock questions after answering. Um, and that's what will effectively prevent the backtracking if you want to do that. 
Um, a lot of folks like this for pedagogical reasons because they say, well, students really should be focusing on one question at a time. Um, and personally, in the past, when I do multiple choice quizzes, uh, sometimes I'll have questions that chain onto each other where the answer to one question um, might be a little bit more obvious from a, a subsequent question in the quiz. Uh, so I kind of want to be able to, to force them to not go back and, and change their answer to the first question. Um, I think also this is really, uh, well, we'll talk about question banks here, but if you're going to use question banks, I, I also like this option in conjunction, in conjunction with question banks myself. All right. um, and so the last setting we're going to talk about is probably one of the more important ones. Um, is one of the, in my experience, uh, less utilized uh, settings here for a quiz, which is around how students are going to get the feedback on their quiz. Okay, so Canvas offers a lot of options around how to show and hide feedback on a quiz. Um, so if you do nothing and set up a quiz, uh, just set it up with the default setting, um, students are going to be able to, after they take the quiz, they're going to see the answers they provided each question. They're going to see which ones of those were correct. And they're also going to see um, the correct answer if it wasn't the one they chose or the one they supplied. Um, so uh, I think there's plenty of ways to control this. Obviously, leaving the door wide open like that can pose some problems. Um, so I think this is one that absolutely should be considered in your courses. Um, because basically, if you think about it, if you just let students go in and look at the right answer uh, whenever they want to, copy paste to a Word document, hey, here's the right answers to the quiz that you're going to take that I already took. You know, it's a very easy thing to do. Um, so you have a lot of options here. There's a box in there beginning with uh, the option to let students see their quiz responses. So first of all, you can just turn that off. If you don't want anybody to see their quiz responses, um, they can see their grade, but they're not going to see any details. Um, that's obviously not really good for, for pedagogical and learning uh, purposes. So there are some middle ground we can there, there's some middle ground we can go to here. Um, I do recommend um, at least think considering uh, adding some date restrictions. So what you can do is say, yeah, I'm I'm going to hide the quiz results and correct responses from students until a certain date, and on this date we're going to release all that. And then you can even go a little further and say, we're going to open only open that data from this date until this date. So the scenario would be you have a quiz that closes on Thursday. And so Friday morning, you open up the results. So everybody can then go, they'll, they'll see their scores right away. But then on Friday, they can go in and see exactly what they got wrong and right and what the right answers were, or however it is you dictate, they're going to be able to do that. But then on Friday at 5 p.m., you close them up again. Um, so students have a limited window to go in and see their, uh, not only their responses, uh, but also the, the correct responses. Because um, we want to provide that valuable feedback for our students, but leaving those default settings in place just opens us up to the vulnerability of a copy and paste um, and students just grabbing those uh, answer keys and handing them to students who may not have taken the quiz yet in, in their course. Um, so that will eliminate at least that, that answer key sharing uh, across the same. Uh, the same course. All right, so those are a, a handful of built-in options that Canvas offers to um, pretty simply um, put up some basic safeguards around your quiz data and your quiz um, answers. Um, but I think what's more important is you know, whether or not you decide to use any of these techniques is talking about um, how to go about designing your questions and your quizzes. Okay. Um, so while the stuff I just talked about will take you maybe a minute or two on every quiz to activate and set up, um, this is where we get into uh, a little more involved planning. Um, and so I, I understand that everybody's workload is different. It might, uh, you know, might not be the same uh, expenditure of effort for uh, person A as person B, depending on their workload. But um, this is going to be where we get into some of the meat and potatoes of the presentation here. Um, so yeah, we can use all those settings to prevent cheating to an extent, um, but really there's a lot more that can be done when you're talking about how you actually design your, your questions and your quizzes. So we're going to start by talking about question banks. So what are question banks? Well, so they're pools of questions that you can pull from at random during a quiz. So if I am developing a quiz on cell structure or a quiz on you know, biology topic, a whatever it is, um, I can have 30 questions around a certain topic like cell structure. 
Um, and then I can say, well, okay, so during a quiz, I don't want to give all 30 to a student. I want to give them 15 questions chosen from this group of 30. Um, and so the reason you consider using this is because if you just have a set question order, if you have the same 15 questions on cell structure for each student, it makes it a heck of a lot simpler for students to just record their answers and share them later. Um, question banks uh, make it mathematically probable that every student is going to receive a unique subset of questions in a unique, in a unique order. Um, so that's a lot, uh, that goes a long way in um, giving each student um, a unique copy of the quiz. Now, of course, a lot of that does depend on your ability to, to design um, questions so that they're assessing the same thing. but. Uh, you know, it's a good starting point here. Uh, so you, in there, you can manage your question banks in any course by going to the quizzes page. There's a little gear icon in the upper right. Uh, and then the only option actually under that gear is manage question banks. Uh, so if you click on that, that'll walk you through setting up your question banks. You can then add a question uh, to a question bank. You can keep adding your questions there. Uh, and then when you're designing your quizzes, you just say, hey, I wanna pull 15 questions from question bank A. Um, for the students, and they're worth one point apiece, you know, or whatever it is. Um, and so I do recommend um, creating multiple questions and that assess the same kind of knowledge if you can. Uh, try to have as, as much as, uh, twice as many questions as you actually want to give. So if you know, hey, I want to give 10 questions on this topic, try and see if you can design 20 and then have Canvas pull randomly from that group. The more you, the more you can do that kind of thing and create a unique quiz for each student, um, the less you're going to have problems with answer key sharing. Another thing that we get sucked into in Canvas a lot is just the ease of using question types that are simple, multiple choice, fill in the blank, true, false. Um, and so Canvas does offer a lot more question types than just these simple question types. Um, now, the trade-off here is that um, not every question type is available to every subject area uh, or relevant to every instructor's uh, course. Um, but you do end up with some of these questions getting a little bit more uh, grading burden put onto the instructor. So um, again, most instructors are going to default for multiple choice, fill in the blank, true, false, because they're the easiest to grade. Um, again, you can set it up so that when, you, when the student takes the quiz and they're done, they can just go through and see their responses right away. Uh, instant feedback, I mean, in this day and age, that's what everybody loves is being able to get that instant gratification, so instant feedback whenever they want it. Uh, but the truth is that those question types are the easiest ones to cheat on. Um, so when you're creating your quiz question, pull down that menu uh, that is the multiple choice. It says multiple choice by default. Um, you can change that to any other question type in there and explore some of those options. Um, you know, consider something simpler, um, like maybe just a, a fill in multiple blanks or uh, if you want to go with a little more overhead, but a little more in-depth knowledge, you can have short answers. You can do like an essay question style for each one. Um, so I'm suggesting here that you try to find uh, different ways to ask your questions. Not not all of them. Um, you don't have to go from a 50 multiple choice question to a 50 essay quiz. Uh, that's, that's not going to be effective. Uh, it's going to be the opposite extreme. Um, but you know, look for things maybe in the middle. Like if you're going to ask several multiple choice, maybe do something like a big matching grid or um, even a file upload. You know, give students if, if that can be something you can assess via a file upload. Um, consider that as well. Again, those do require manual grading, but they will be a little bit less likely to uh, a little less susceptible to cheating. So I kind of put together based on the question types that Canvas has available the, the Cheeto meter. Um, so. In my opinion, this is all just my opinion, um, but the ones that are easier to cheat on are going to be multiple choice, true, false, fill in the blank, uh, numerical answer, just very simple, straightforward, yes, no type responses. Um, go, we move up the spectrum a little bit, uh, fill in multiple blanks, multiple drop downs, where you get a little more dynamic uh, context around your answers. Uh, fairly tough, you go to matching and multiple answer, uh, and then very tough are the formula, which is great if you're a math teacher. I'll tell you that, that question post often. Um, formula, essay, and file upload. Those are going to be your hardest one. Uh, of course, as you go up this scale, um, the level of effort required to grade them is actually going to increase as well. So that's again the trade-off there. Um, okay, another thing I'm going to recommend uh, is redesigning and revamping quizzes each semester. So 
how many of you folks have simply recycled an old quiz to a new semester without changing it? Um, I can't see your hands at the moment, but my guess is that a lot of you have. Um, and again, with the workloads that a lot of you carry, it's, it's not surprising and I, I don't blame you for, at all for doing it. I've done it too. Um, but recently, a lot of the big cheating stuff we've had to deal with comes from students in old classes providing answers to students who are taking the classes next semester. Uh, this website, this uh, coursehero.com, is one of many websites out there that we've found to, to be hosting documents that are basically quiz answer keys. Um, the students will copy down a quiz, they'll paste it into a Word doc, and they'll post it with the uh, UNCG and then course, the course code, quiz one, and then they'll post it there. And, you know, these websites that are supposed to be helping students study, they just, they can't keep up with the volume of content that's being posted and rely on users to say, hey, this shouldn't be up here. Um, but if nobody ever checks for it, um, nobody's going to be able to take it down. Um, so going back a little bit, if you're just looking to redesign the old quiz, uh, again, consider using question banks instead. Uh, they can help combat this at a semi-automated level. Um, the quiz will be the same for each student, so if they find an answer key out there, it's not necessarily going to match the quiz they're taking. If you don't want to do that, or if you want to do this in addition, I highly recommend you make changes each semester. Um, you can even do things like changing the format uh, without changing a lot of the substance of the question. You can change question wording, uh, do a which of these is versus which of these is not, change your own some answer choices. Um, if you can at least make it a little bit harder for the student, if they have an answer key, if you can make it a little bit harder for them to say, oh, this is the same question, instill that little bit of doubt, um, that's even worth it. It's a little extra work, of course, um, but it is going to put in a lot of extra work trying to catch and punish your cheaters, too. Um, I think I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to try to uh, move a little bit more quickly through these last couple slides. Um, I did have a slide in here about quiz expectations and context. The basic gist of this is basically saying, okay, are you giving, are, are you placing too much emphasis on your quizzes in your course? Are students going in and, and saying every quiz matters really a lot, high stakes is for a grade? They're going to feel more pressure to cheat if the quiz is uh, worth more to them. So an approach I've seen taken before is basically is to make quizzes either open book or to make them practice quizzes so that the student is not feeling as much pressure to perform and thus not really saying is it worth it to go ahead and cheat. So um, there's that one summarized for you. Um, one thing that I also want to point out here um, is around proctoring. So obviously online quizzes um, are not things that we can regulate unless you actually have the student take the quiz from a web browser and a computer in the same room, um, which again, I've, I've seen them as well. Um, but I do want to mention that in this day and age of, of you know, internet independence, I guess, uh, students love to be able to take the quiz from wherever they are, wherever they uh, happen to be at that moment. Um, we do have options available for um, introducing some of the traditional proctoring in here. Um, we, uh, UNCG is part of the UNC online proctoring network. Uh, I have a few links here. Um, so what that means is for web-based courses, we can set up a proctored exam. Uh, we can have it done in person or via webcam through a service called ProctorU. Um, you can do this. You don't have to re-enter the quizzes into the, specifically into the UNC online system. You can say, hey, I'm, I'm, giving, a, I'm giving this quiz on Canvas and provide a link to it. Um, so there's more details. This is uh, something I've actually never personally done, um, but I don't teach anymore, so I don't have that opportunity. Um, so um, let me make sure I have the right notes here. Uh, yeah, there's a cost to do this. That's the big downside. So students are going to have to pay to take a proctored exam. Um, how much they pay depends on the method, if you do online versus in person. And then if they do it in person, uh, they have to find a site close to them and uh, those sites can vary in price as well. Um, so if you're going to use this, I, I do recommend it be for more of your, I guess, quote unquote, high stakes quizzes, like your midterm or your final exam. Um, and obviously, you really want to make sure that your students know that there are going to be some exam fees, uh, probably even before they sign up for the course. You're going to want to make that clear to them. So. All right. Again, fast mode here. Um, so... All right, let me take a couple of extra minutes here and just do this. I want to make sure you have enough time for questions, but I do want to go through some of this. So when you have gone through and you think you have done everything you want to do to 
to cure your quizzes and to design them to deter cheating and everything, how do you go through enforcing all of this? So um, I always like the, the phrase, the best defense is a good offense. Um, that's what I subscribe to personally. Um, so to recap, use the tools available to you, take extra time if you can afford it to create more content than you need and to make sure you're not recycling content and to take advantage of fracturing for your higher stakes exams. So those are things you can proactively do to take down uh, cheating. Um, so when your offense fails, um, we're going to talk about acceptable quiz taking behavior just in a little bit. I'm going to gloss over some of this stuff here just so I make sure I have time to talk about that. Um, Canvas has a couple of technical things you can look at um, that can provide some extra data around quiz, activ uh, quiz, quiz activity. Um, so what you can do is take a look at a quiz session and be able to tell when students take certain actions during the quiz. So you can tell when they've looked at a question, answered a question, uh, flagged a question, if that's a feature you're allowing in your quizzes. Um, and they can also take a look at when they may have been inattentive to the quiz. Um, this is a feature called quiz log auditing. Uh, so you're going to go to settings, feature options, and enable this in your courses. Um, then you can view a student quiz log by going to the speed grader. Um, documentation link is there. It's important to understand about this feature. Um, I'll come back to this in just a second. Uh, that's what a quiz log might look like. Um, we got to be careful with this feature. A lot of folks say this is a great thing. I can see exactly when a student was cheating and when they were not cheating. And the reality is, no, this feature is a beta feature. Um, what that means in, in programming speak is basically it's, it's not fully baked yet. It's not done yet. There may be some unresolved bugs. There may not be, there may be some things that don't behave as expected. Um, so you got to take everything with a grain of salt. Um, and really, if you bring a student to academic integrity hearing and say, here's your quiz log, I'm, you cheated, obviously, from this quiz log, that's not going to hold up. Um, and, and here's why. Quiz logs don't tell us, um, you know, so they will try to flag. Let me go back a slide or two. They will try on the right side there. You can see events like when they stopped viewing the quiz taking page and they came back to it. Um, instructors love looking at that and saying, oh, they were looking at something else. But maybe they were, but we can't tell what that was. You know, was a student just dismissing a pop-up that their computer needed an update? Or were they trying to, did they get a Skype call and they forgot to close Skype and they're trying to close it out or whatever it is? We can't tell from those quiz logs. Um, and so we really, there's also um, an inability for us to tell the difference between the student being uh, idle on the page. Uh, sometimes Canvas will trigger uh, um, one of those red X events during that situation. Sometimes um, if a student has a just terrible internet connection, they lose connectivity, um, Canvas might flag them there as well. So we, we, we don't know exactly what Canvas is seeing. And we, even, if, even if we know the student wasn't looking at the quiz, we don't know what they were looking at. So take these quiz logs with a grain of salt. Um, a lot of folks email, um, submit tickets to administrators saying, oh, hey, can you help me prove the student cheated? And um, no, we can't do that. I mean, we don't know much more than you guys know. Um, the one thing we do have um, access to is full page view logs for students. So we can basically see what pages in Canvas they were looking at um, and when. Um, but we really, again, we can't do too much more with that information because even if we determine that students looking at a different page in the middle of your quiz, uh, we don't know if they were reading that page or just had it open by accident or something. Uh, we just know the page was loaded. So um, why do I mention all this then? Um, because basically what you're going to be trying to establish in your courses is this um, acceptable quiz taking behavior. And I think if you take nothing else out of this session, I really want you to consider this portion right here. Um, so we can't use any of these tools or techniques to completely get ourselves away from the fact that students are going to cheat. And we can't use these tools solely to prove that they did cheat. Um, but what we can do is start going down this, this rabbit hole of, you know, they, these students are doing things that you are defining as unacceptable. They're in a violation of your class policy. That's going to stand up a little bit better when you're meeting with a student than trying to go straight to academic integrity. Um, so let's try and talk about setting expectations real quick. What a lot of people do on their syllabus, they'll say, hey, here's a bunch of things to not do while you're taking a quiz. Don't use cell phones, internet sites, books, whatever it is. 
the list goes on and on and on. And, and you're never going to keep up with telling everybody what they can't do um, because they're always going to be one step out of you, right? Um, all this stuff really doesn't carry as much weight. So instead, let's take the opposite approach. Convey what you define as acceptable quiz-taking behavior. So for the duration of the quiz, it's your responsibility to adhere to acceptable quiz-taking behavior defined as follows. Tell them they're going to take, the, take the quiz on a computer. Tell them they're going to be setting themselves up in an appropriate environment. Tell them to close everything else out, silence their computer notifications. Um, if you're worried about them looking at other stuff, make sure you spell out. Canvas, the Canvas quiz paper is going to be the full size of your screen and is the only thing you're going to look at in your computer. Now, if you outline this and set that environment up for them and you put that right in your syllabus, okay, that's going to give you more of a leg to stand on when the student says, oh, well, yeah, well, I, I did have my window open, but I was just looking over, you know, I like to, I, I, I've heard of all that students say, oh, I was just, I was doing this quick shoe shopping while I was taking a quiz. I'm, I'm, I kid you not. I've heard that. And it's like, well, okay, yeah, maybe you weren't cheating, but how in the world do you think that's acceptable to do during a quiz? So that's, um, this is unfortunately necessary, but you know, you think about it, and again, we're moving to a more online environment in our education system. And so we really need to make sure students understand what acceptable quiz taking behavior looks like. Okay. Now, might this be a little bit harsh? Uh, I think so. If you set that up and you basically say, hey, if you don't follow this policy, I can charge you with economic integrity violations. Yeah, maybe that's harsh. But the truth of the matter is, like Amanda was saying, I mean, we need to make sure that students understand um, exactly what you know exactly what it means to take a quiz because hey students for, for them the norm is multitasking the norm is oh i can just do this while i'm on the bus the norm is you know we need to make sure that we are taking the time to establish the fact that here's what we expect when you are taking the quiz okay um, so let's go back and revise our playing offense those four things we already talked about plus Make sure, make sure students are aware that you have information. I, did, I kind of glossed over that, but those quiz logs are also good to show students at the beginning of the semester to say, hey, look at, I know what you're doing during your quiz, so don't screw around, right? Um, but also, these, this establishment of clear policy and acceptable course taking behavior, um, I think is a very important thing to, to consider writing into your syllabus. Okay, so again, I apologize for talking so fast there toward the end, um, but I think I've left at least a few minutes um, for questions here if anybody has them, so. Um. so. So far in the chat, there's been some comments. Laurie said that um, she set up proctoring for the class at UCU, and she said it was about 20 to $30 for a two-hour session, so just like an FYI. And then um, Ben commented, I really love this acceptable quiz taking behavior approach. It's a nice way of framing positive behaviors instead of, as you say, keeping up with all of the possible negative behaviors. And then Laurie well, had some comments about proctoring. Um, there's no sites available at UNCG for proctoring. That's so, correct. Yeah, I did see that. And that's a good thing to note. Yeah, I think Laurie yeah. is correct. We don't have proctoring available at UNCG. They have to go off campus for um, in-person proctoring, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I know that there's some at the library downtown, I think. Uh, I yeah, the issue, I mean, sure. just in, if anyone's curious, is that we actually, one librarian here does proctoring, but I think he explained to me that it's illegal for us to do proctoring for UNCG students. Like it, it, it's like something with the, our accreditation that they have to go off campus for it to be appropriate proctoring, which is kind of weird, but I learned that coming hmm. to the library. There we go. Yeah, okay. and I, I know that that system exists. We've talked about it a lot um, on and off, but I've, that's something I actually never never used, and I, I taught for a few years here before I moved to ITS, but uh, never used it during that time. Does anyone else have um, comments or questions for Amanda or Matt before we go? I know we're at 2.02, but this is the time to have the conversation if you want to have it. I just wanted to say real quickly <laughs> during my presentation, this is Amanda. Mm -hmm. um, 
the acceptable use policy is what I was trying to think of when I think it was Ben that might have asked earlier about um, do we need to let students know that they are submitting work that's getting stored in, in these databases and the note is there in the acceptable use policy which they're essentially agreeing to when they act when students activate their computing accounts there's a note there that lets them know that um, their papers are submitted to for text similarity review uh, by anti-plagiarism service just want to clear that up Sorry, I was. <laughs> so since it's past two, I'm going to wrap it up because I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, just some, you know, great information, great comments. So um, the next webinar coming up is on February 5th at 1 p.m. and is about using rubrics and is by a UNCG ITC. Um, so feel free to come to that. Um, the webinar um, guide that I've put in the chat a couple times now. Um, I'm putting it in one more time, has sign up, more information, I already included links that we talked about today on here, um, just to, you know, let everyone have those at their disposal. The recording will be also on there, but if you signed up for this and if you're here today, we will um, include that as well. So um, keep that in mind. But are there any other questions before I end this? Okay, well, I hope everyone has a great day, and see you guys soon.